Body. What an irresistible invitation to present one's intellectual biography. So thank you, Furman, and your team at Architects Not Architecture to reflect on why the work of my practice is what it is or has been what's guided its intents and preoccupations. So here are some of my paths. There could be many more, but we might touch on that in the conversation to follow. Robin Boyd is arguably the most influential architect there has been in Australia, certainly in Melbourne. And for a long time, I thought I'd been conceived in a Robin Boyd building. Um, the Black Dolphin Motel, to be specific. I was under the architecturally romantic misapprehension that my earliest beginnings, I had been, uh, from the earliest beginnings, I'd been infiltrated by Boydisms and that this encountered in part for the affinity I feel for his work. My mother has since confirmed that Marimbula, where the hotel is, was not the place. But I have a deeper consideration to understanding the nature of this infinity and have come to recognise that it's both viscerally personal and rationally professional. I did at least stay there once as a very young child. And I remember the relief of shade the room offered from the beachside heat, the grazing of arms on bagged brick walls, looking up at a black and white ceiling as I daydreamed from my bed below. Family stuff sat on the timber bench that ran along the wall from inside to out. I recall now the informal landscape of banksies and gums with butterfly chairs slouching out the front of the unit seeming loosely perfect and my father encouraging me to record the time each evening that the cicadas started their chorus. Fifteen years later, I worked there in the restaurant over summer. The architecture was a bonus that came with a job. It seemed a treat to scurry below and inhabit the dark stained timber beams of um, the dining room to park each day before, beside the telegraph pole columns, lean warmth. I think I absorbed some early lessons in living through feeling the spirit that came from this combination of, in Boyd's words, space, structure and surface. It makes me speculate on the permeability between ourselves and the buildings we inhabit, how they become embedded in us and formative of the spatial repertoire that we play out through our work years on. Our buildings are perhaps the culmination of this overlap of childhood, life or spatial experience with the formal education of an architect. And it's this I want to trace tonight. So um, the infiltration of that on our own work. Yet Boyd's mantra to do the essential thing as simply and purely as possible was challenged by my training. Mid 80s, in pluralist, additive, some would argue excessive Melbourne a culture fostered by RMIT where I became a pracademic and taught for many years and continue there as an adjunct professor. Here the model was design teaching by leading design practitioners of our city. Ac the academy and industry were not considered separate but rather entwined and each informing the other. Venturi Scott Brown's Learning from Las Vegas was a preeminent text in our quest for local architecture and the decorated shed one hands down over the duck. A challenge to Frampton's uh, more crafted vernacular critical regionalism at the time, instead we celebrated the ugly and the ordinary, the prosaic tropes and defaults of a suburban vernacular. Sorry. Um, Peter Corrigan led this quest and was a big influence on me, less on form and more on method. He drew my attention to the local and helped me solve a predicament of architecture. On the one hand, I'd been formed by the aesthetics training and inheritance of the global discipline in architecture with all its richness and traditions. And I'm grateful through Corrigan's 20th century history that I inherited people like Aspland, Haring, Sharoon, Barrigan and so on. On the other hand, my skills, my location and histories were particular to here. So my desire to intervene in place was to be irreducibly local and specific. So Peter directed an interest in a deliberately parochial understanding of context to understand or examine what constitutes localness and foster this through architecture. He expanded the grammar of architecture to speak a dialect inflected by here. And their fire stations that you can see these images became key reference points for our series of police stations. It showed a way to counter suburban as a generic condition and demonstrate instead how architecture of modest civic buildings could dignify the experience of the everyday and the ordinary in our suburbs and towns. 
But if I respected the intellectual provocation of Edmund and Corrigan, I felt pure experiential joy in being within, encompassed by the form and material of Robinson Chen's houses, another practice locally I was profoundly influenced by in the crucial year I worked with them in 88, 89. Certainly my tendency towards mass and deteriority and the capacity to hold one in space was learnt from Robinson Chen and continues to play out in our own housings. So a conundrum. I felt moved by Robinson Chen, but wanting the intellectual challenge of Edmund and Corrigan. And I resented these sorts of false proles or tribalisms and these restrictive oppositions, which Leon Van Skyck captured in his various ideograms and developed a tripolar model for Melbourne architecture to counter that. And which led me to gradients via Steve Reich and his music for 18 musicians. 1983, waking to this one morning on the friend, to the floor of a friend's brother's Canberra's flat was an epiphany of sorts. It's pulsing rhythms, interweaving of different instruments, different voices, different tempos of increasing and diminishing dominance, infiltrated my dreams, ever so gently moved me from asleep, dozing to awake. It encapsulated for me the concept of the gradient as a way to render the in-between, the transitional or the gray zones of so much more interest to me than the more definitive black and white ends of any spectrum. So between architecture and landscape, figure and ground, inside and outside, public and private, new and old, like and unlike. For me, gradient architecture became a tool for actually building the moments between the opposites or calibration. And it preempted and held clues to an ecological thinking of ecotones as gradients of ecologies. And these early, this early foolishness of asserting that a line that we draw could separate or be used to claim a site as utterly or only private seemed absurd, like the absurdity of ocean boundaries. And I want to read a quote from Jeff Park's Theatre Country by David Quanham. The carpet is 12 feet by 18, say. That gives us a 216 square feet of continuous woven material. Is the knife razor sharp? If not, we hone it. We set about cutting the carpet into 36 equal pieces, each one a rectangle, two feet by three. Never mind the hardwood floor, the severing fibres release small squeaky noises like the muted yelps of outraged Persian weavers. Never mind the weavers. When we finish cutting, we measure the individual pieces, total them up and find that, lo, there's still nearly 216 square feet of recognisably carpet-like stuff. But what does that amount to? Have we got 36 nice Persian throw rugs? No, all we've left is three dozen fragments, each one worthless and commencing to come apart. Jeff Park's writing in theatre country problematised for me how land subdivision, the promised autonomy of land ownership, fosters a connection, a conception of site as one of these separate pieces, disconnected and detached with no obligation beyond its own needs or its neighbours, let alone to a bigger context. So it reminded me that no matter whether we were dealing with urban, suburban or rural sites, it's always part of a continuum, a system, water being an obvious example, because floods clearly don't respect property titles and many of our projects are in flood or fire zones. Um, hydrology diagrams in this show a sort of expanded sphere of special consequence and responsibility which become inevitable to account for our actions on sites that may impact beyond boundaries. An approach to sustainability of this course underpinned by this kind of thinking. But importantly too, it's not just what we see, it's not just the picturesque, but it's also a performative and a cultural landscape that was beginning, I was beginning to recognise. Um, in 1983, a major lesson for me came through walking the Lurajari Trail. This is an 80 kilometre walk or route along the coast of northwest Australia, the country of Paddy Rowe and his ancestors, the Gularabalu community. There's nothing like walking every day for a minimum of four hours, sometimes 14, to really appreciate the ground you might otherwise take for granted. An increased attuneness, sensitivity and capacity to see the minutest of variations in its condition. Tracks of creatures, subtle shifts in its resistance underfoot, its geology, its vegetation, its dry or wetness, its stability and so on. Hard and unforgiving and then gradually softening amongst mangroves where our legs sunk into mud to our thighs, our shoes sucked off and our toes 
a metre below, feeling disconcertingly the roots of the mangroves. We're in crocodile country, and was it really just the root of a mangrove and not the nose of a croc that I was feeling through my feet? Um, learning the language of the Roebuck Plains is not to discover in the same features of European landscapes. It's of a different order. There are hills and valleys to be found, but how frustrating for the European to find they're so slight. Fingers with their sparse covering of gum and wattle stretch out across the mudflats. We have to see the plains in terms of a series of tracks and in terms of underground sources of water." End of quote. Here I learnt that a landscape we as architects might describe as empty is in fact full of meaning and of stories. It's only our cultural lit illiteracy that stops us from reading it. It reinforced to me that physical space remains empty without a cultural framework, daily habits and practices to bring it to life. On that same trip, we made camp for a few days alongside a smattering of paper barks and a dry river bed. The women prepared our tucker amongst a cluster of eskies, they're what you keep things cool in, fold up tables and a fire pit formed with a sandy hollow. When kids came running too close, the women yelled, get out of the kitchen. It surprised me, but then I came to realise that of course, this makeshift arrangement was a kitchen, yes, because that's how they were using this settlement of sorts, which I've tried to sketch as you see below. It was architecture without walls. It was a fine counter to a learnt preoccupation with physical structures as evidence of occupation, a sentiment sadly still reflected in Australia's problematic relationship with its colonial history. Our attachment to place is formed in so many ways and architecture is but a strand of this attachment rather than the main event. We moved house a lot and my mother honed her immense skill at making home and quickly. Within the space of 24 hours, boxes were unpacked, household goods placed, arranged, so that on waking we were once again surrounded by familiar things, placed for our daily habits to settle into, even if at first the distance between table and fridge was greater, or orientation of a bedroom window was now a bit further east, or the stairs a little steeper than the last, the light a little brighter, the noises or sounds a little less foreboding. I appreciate how Bachelard describes these knowings through our memory or our bodies as a group of organic habits and notes too that the word habit, as he puts it, is too worn a word to express this passionate liaison of our bodies which do not forget with an unforgettable house. And so his discussions were very important to me of how these sorts of habits of being in our homes becomes embedded into our bodies. Um, this attention to making home and forging a relationship between house and occupant is central to our residential work and of course for that we look to many precedents. Um, I've always been fascinated by these sorts of surveys of other people's plans where you see their traits and their little habits, if you like, of making architecture come through and how that's influenced our own. This attention to making home, um, sorry, um, and how the ways in which this bond between person and eventual home or space is mutually defined. You, you adjust to the space, the space adjusts to you. And that's fascinating to me in our making of, of spaces. I think this attention of mind to an embodied experience of architecture stems also from a late 80s, early 90s post-structuralist studies, revisiting phenomenology of say Merleau-Ponty through a feminist lens of Iris Marion Young and her classic essay, Throwing Like a Girl. A linking of bodily comportment, training and experience of being in space and whether experiencing it as a comfort or a threat. So how might my own lived experience inform design directions or directly? And in the case of some toilets we did some time ago, thinking about what it means to use these, anticipating what it feels like and embedding that in the process. Sometimes I describe this way of anticipating in design a kinesthetic empathy, a kind of muscle memories at work here, I think, understood from years playing the violin. When watching and listening now to someone else playing it, I experiencing it, I experience it as an embodied memory. And I've thought that this projection of one's embodied self into another's action or space might be used to foster spatial empathy and to aid the design process, a heightened anticipation of the sensorial aspects of an eventual space while still in its imagined beginnings. I think this is how 
I or architects, we know a space well before it's built. It's light, it's coolness, it's warmth, or it's acoustic qualities. It's an attempt to put oneself in the other's shoes with the other being the eventual occupant. It may also relate to my being a synesthete, understanding or feeling numbers, letters um, within a gradient of lightness and darkness. Um, this overlapping of senses as a way of knowing, I think sometimes helps design. And it leads me to Tanazaki's much loved In Praise of Shadows, which captures my interest in darkness, a quality intrinsic to many of our interiors, um, as a device for resisting Australia's unrelenting quest from lightness or brightness uh, by offering a retreat of sorts. And this quote from Tanazaki, in making for ourselves a place to live, we first spread a parasol to throw a shadow on the earth, and in the pale light of the shadow we put together a house. And certainly even that thinking, I think, informs some of Boyd's work, which I started with, this idea of the roof as parasol. Um, in Lake Ponawara, it disguises, the house disguises its figure, its objectness in the shadow as a black line inscribing a larger territory. Figure for me really is just the means to an end, which is interior space and territory. Similarly, the cut or the edit in the creation of a void is often more powerful than the addition. And I think Lacaton Vassal's influence on me here is considerable as well. What we take away, not just what we add. But going back to shadows and more importantly, the absence of them, one of my earliest architectural pilgrimages was to Rossi and Inonimo's Galatarese. I was living in Milano at the time where I worked in the studio of Matteo Tun for half a year. Weekends were used to traipse out beyond the charms of the gentle Risorico and witness the real Italy in its periferia. Here was a lesson on the ideal and the actual. As a student back in Melbourne, I'd been enraptured by Rossi's beautiful pen and ink depictions his chiaroscuro, de like using form to render shadows, the interplay of light and dark. So with these in mind, these images, these sketches, I ventured to Galateresi, but as is common in Milan, La Nebbia, the fog, had claimed the air around the white apparition and no shadows were to be found. Instead, a kind of dull, um, unoccupied and quite a cold or grim scene, not to take away from the architecture, of course, but it did make me wonder how as architects we sometimes can resist the very preconditions of the situation we are given to work with and the need for the ideal or the idea, the intent to fit this predominant condition, whatever that might be. This balancing of ideal and actual, of course, comes into place relentlessly on site. Here, best laid plans are disrupted or called into question by all sorts of unforeseen events and the infamous character of architect and builder gets relitigated or rolled out in all its predictability of who wants what. With my uncle and my mother, they did a lot of building work. And for me, after school entertainment was often a visit to a half demolished house. I witnessed my mother comfortable in this space and equally comfortable sometimes doing the messy work on site. So for me, site as a workplace was always an option. During studies, I did a fair bit of work on site at first, because I was otherwise pretty useless in an office when I first started, I had no CAD skills. But later, having done a lot of hospitality work, I could organise stuff and people. So when an end of year site party was needed, I helped make that happen. And because of that, my boss asked me what I would rather be doing, to which I said site work. So began my role with Robinson Chen as a go between back and forth from building site to architect's office. And I learned a lot about buildability and parallel to that about drawing, how architecture, the lines we define it by, can direct, frustrate or align with the process of construction. And also about the art of improvising, something my father always encouraged, such as the time I lamented not having a paintbrush and him helping me make one with a snippet of hair, chopstick and a bit of fishing wire. How to realise the conceptual through a direct, sometimes conventional approach to making with prosaic materials, especially bricks. Bricks, the substance of much of our architectural production. And I can attribute this material tendency in part to the time and place of my architectural education, Melbourne again in the 80s when postmodernism revived a preoccupation with our vernacular, with our terraces and the associative possibilities of masonry, ornamental opportunities of polychromatic brickwork, which played out in our Victorian and Edwardian streetscapes, later in broader suburban landscape. 
but there are many more personal reasons too. I started tonight's talk with questioning the extent to which personal experience overlaps with professional training, informing the repertoire of an architect. So I'm going to end that way too. Bricks are in the blood. My grandfather's family produced them in Germany for centuries and he invented the Habler kiln, which to this day remains reasonably energy efficient in remote situations where electricity is unavailable. I have one of his bricks, a treasured heirloom, which I dug up from Bohemian soil during a family tour in 2001. A red brick of Pilsen ground has found a resting place as doorstop alongside a differently red brick in the walls of a Fitzroy warehouse in Melbourne. Architecture is comprised of many histories and as an Instagram wit posted the other day, everyone here is one of either First Nations, convict, migrant or refugee. Coming full circle, it makes some kind of sense that I, a child of a middle European refugee who formed part of Melbourne's diaspora, came from landscapes associated with dislocation and unspeakable trauma. Now I apply these brick learnings to a building that in fact contains artifacts, stories and memories of one aspect of this past in Melbourne's Jewish Holocaust Centre, which is currently under construction, and will, importantly, be able to have glass bricks to attest to the relative freedom here to speak of one's ancestry. Thank you for listening to these meanderings, and I look forward to picking up some of these thoughts in our conversation to follow. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Kirsten. Thank you for Hi. your Thank you for your talk. Thank you. Um, can you hear me well? Yes, right? Yes, I can. Thanks. Yes. That's great. Um, this is really nice that you uh, finish with sentences like uh, bricks are in my blood, in my blood. <laughs> um, I'm talking about your, uh, the influence of your family and your past. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a quote of you um, saying, I shall credit my mom uh, with making it seem perfectly, no perfectly normal to be on a side. Yeah. Yes. Um, how have your mother influenced you throughout uh, your life? Can you tell us a bit more about uh, the influence? Um, I think I think certainly she taught me a lot about. Um, I mean, apart from her heritage and how that infiltrates through you anyway. I remember she's always had an extremely um, pragmatic. Ex uh, trait as well so and I think sometimes you know my uncle really especially she and her were very suspicious of architects as these kind of idealists and these dreamers and so I would often when I first said I wanted to be an architect it was slightly they were slightly horrified um, so I think I was always interested in how to bring something of a kind of a degree of common sense but also an idealism and to match these two things. My mother was obsessed with hooks, you know, thinking where would someone need to hang something in a space and so that very mm. um, immediate everyday thing was as important to me as a big idea you might have as an architect about some other thought. Mm. So that's one way, yeah. Actually it's funny that you mentioned your uncle because yeah. uh, I have also a quote for, from him saying that Oh no. Uh, he, saw, he saw the architects <laughs> as these slight, slightly difficult people. Yes. Sure. Now, decades later, um, how do you feel about this? Was he right? He's, well, he, used to, he told me a terrible story once of an architect, not me, another one, who came on site in a black velvet cape robe. And That's the way to do it. Asking, asking for it from the subbies. And um, he had very dusty hands from being on site and patted him on the back and it left the mark on the cape. So oh. I think this was their image of the architect and their disassociation from the site, which I think again, because of my interest in site work, it was to try to bring those things together. I'm interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, that's very really nice. Um, actually, um, you, were, you were used to spend uh, one out of four weeks in New Zealand. That's right, uh, yeah. Uh, I guess this is not possible right now. <laughs> no, um, that's right. I would normally be doing exactly that. That's right. And how did this time away help your creative process and maybe also your work and life balance? Yeah. Um, I find the week 
a way, a really, I say that as a time to to concentrate on design, especially mm. um, that more, it's very focused time for me, even though I'm contactable and occasional meetings. And I think now life of COVID will have destroyed the refuge that that provided before because now everyone is on Zoom. But it did provide a time to just do the sort of um, more research intensive background thinking to projects. Mm. And there's been some really important work I've done in that in that period there. Once I stopped teaching, which was what I was previously doing there. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Actually, um, you were very engaged with education. And yes. you still are, but uh, in our previous previous meeting, you told us that uh, you are not no much not so much time right now. So maybe maybe yeah. in the near future. Yeah. Um, Always. How are you like? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say. I think, um, especially with RMIT, there has always been this very close link, like I talked about before. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, teaching has been a way to get clarity of thinking, <laughs> and then to to teaching. I bring something of the messiness and contingency of practice. So I see them as very um, helpful to each other. Yeah, both in power mm. and mix. And how do, how, um, what change would you like to, to see to the, in today's education? Uh, it's really interesting. It's a really good question. I think sometimes just the ordinary project is actually a really good project because mm. really we never, we don't generally choose a lot of the commissions we get given and I think it's the really ordinary brief that can be extraordinary is where our efforts are well spent. Um, so I care a lot about that type of project because you can bring a lot of ideas to the most perfunctory of brief. And the other thing I would say is for a long time housing here was seen as very unfashionable um, and I think now uh, people are starting to recognise just how important it is to do housing well, especially mm. with the sort of crisis that's everywhere, actually. So it's starting to be recognised again as a really important place for architectural thinking and endeavour. Maybe that's not news to you, but it has been a bit of a push here. Yeah. Mm, that's again, great. ordinary and every day. Yeah. Mm. And um, I remember um, a talk of you with the topic ethics in architecture. Ah, oh, yes. Do, yeah. do you recognize uh, your ethics in your, so your personal ethics in your, <clears throat> so, sorry, in your early projects and in your current projects? Yeah, I think that that, that talk was, was a sort of summer, summation, if you like, of how I was thinking about that and how any project um, can be practiced in a way and real spatial impacts can come out through thinking that way. And really, I touched on it a little bit tonight when I talked about, you know, cutting up a rug or thinking about sites as disconnected, mm -hmm. that as soon as we understand that the site we work on through that and through our projects has a larger responsibility to what is beyond it, that for me is fundamental to our way of working, that we're always connected to something we can either contribute and, and build that or we can destroy it and that is the choice we face every day as architects in any kind of project. Mm. Yeah. One of uh, your early choices um, was to to establish your own com your own architectural practice. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons was um, to be able to balance mm -hmm. private life and professional life. Yeah. It was a good um, theory. <laughs> it, it didn't work. <laughs> I, I think I, I think certainly um, there was a degree of choice there uh, because ultimately it was my problem if I didn't make that balance work. It, it's fair to say it's taken um, some time to try and not every day it works to try and get that balance for everyone else here as well. But I, I will say that it was trying to counter a myth that I saw here a lot, that unless you worked seven days a week, um, you know, 15 hour days, you couldn't mm. be serious about architecture. And I think that's a very poor basis for, um, for you know, good work to happen. It's, it's just mm. not sustainable. 
But as I say, some days are more balanced than other days. That's so, right. Yeah. So I guess yeah. right now is nobody, nobody's at the office because everyone is enjoying life, um, so work and life That's balance. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I can notice too, even in this time of COVID, you know, it has put a lot of extra pressures on people and I notice how much, I see what time emails are coming in, I can see people are working long mm. hours at the moment. So it's slow, it's laborious working remotely like this. So it's mm. adding, it's not helping that balance in some way. Actually, yeah. that um, regarding how are you um, working at these COVID times well, could be a question for the roundtable discussion. Sure. Maybe we um, yeah, sure. we take it to the conversation later with John. Sure. So from now, um, first, thank you for your talk and for the interview. So and we will meet later in like 30 minutes for our okay. roundtable discussion. Right. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. Thank you. Thank you.